SEP Fanfic Readings presents Aurelian by Biddy Blue Eyes. Chapter 8 Change and Commitment. Hello, Hermione announced her arrival as she let herself into the burrow. Ah, Hermione, you're just in time for lunch, Mrs. Weasley smiled from the kitchen counter. So, did everything go all right? Mrs. Weasley knew that Harry and Hermione had met with Malfoy and gone to Hogwarts to see Professor McGonagall, but they had decided not to let her know about the memories. The only others who knew of them were Ron and Ginny. Yes, we got what we were looking for, Hermione told her. She was still rather unsettled by all of the things she had seen and heard in the pensive. It felt strange to stand and talk to the woman that only a short time ago had been wrapped in a white sheet, lying on the ground in front of a burning castle. Harry didn't stop by here, did he? Harry? No, I thought he was with you, Molly said seriously. Though many things had changed in the two years since the war, and people had become relaxed and comfortable, Molly still bore the internal scars of war. She easily became stressed when people weren't where they were expected to be. And the fact that Harry, Ron, and Hermione had taken up positions in magical law enforcement did not help those feelings. Oh, he was, but after the meeting we went our separate ways and he didn't tell me where he was going. I expect he's back at the office, Hermione replied. Where's Aurelian? He's out in the garage with Arthur, she answered with a smile. They've been having a grand time this morning. He's such an adorable and brilliant child, Hermione. You should be proud. Hermione's inside squirmed. She knew that she should feel proud, but she really hadn't had a hand in raising him. It was her future self, someone she really didn't know, that raised him. Her and her future Draco, that she really didn't know either. Although she felt she knew the future Draco better than she did the present day one. At the look on Hermione's face, Molly's expression changed to one of empathy. Hermione could tell that the woman thought that her discomfort had to do with the fact that Draco Malfoy was Aurelian's father. While it did feel quite awkward, the main part of her discontent was her own acceptance that she had a two-year-old son that she had known nothing about until a couple days ago. Hermione had not had any intention of keeping the identity of Aurelian's father a secret from the Weasleys. Harry, however, had different ideas and insisted that it would be best to tell only Ron and Ginny. Of course, when Ron found out, everyone else in the family did. Hermione wouldn't have been surprised if all of Ottery St. Catchpole heard that she had a child with Draco Malfoy, due to the loud volume in which Ron had expressed his opinion on the matter. It had felt like he blamed her for something that she had not chosen. She was just as shocked as he had been to learn that in the future she had married Malfoy. It was something she never would have imagined. After their time in the pensive, though, it did not surprise her how they came together under those specific circumstances. If lunch is ready, I'll just go call Aurelian and Mr. Weasley in, Hermione offered. That would be wonderful. Thank you, dear, Molly said with a sad smile. Hermione groaned inwardly. She didn't want people pitying her. Hello, Hermione greeted as she entered the garage. It never ceased to surprise her just how many muggle items Mr. Weasley collected. The garage was filled with stacks of items that lined every wall. Mummy, Aurelian cried happily. He stood up in the sidecar of Sirius's old flying motorbike and smiled broadly. Uncle Art has a motorbike. I drive it. Hermione laughed when she saw that Aurelian was wearing an old leather aviator's cap that was much too big for him and a set of 80s-style headphones. We're not really going anywhere, Arthur assured her. Hermione tried her hardest not to laugh out loud at Mr. Weasley, too. He was kneeling at the front of the vehicle in a set of overalls with a neon green shirt underneath and a bandana that covered most of his ginger hair. A confused expression twisted his brow as he read from a large, detailed mechanics book. So focused on his task, he didn't seem to consider the black grease on his hands before tending the itch on his neck, effectively drawing a dark smudge over his freckled skin. I should hope not, Hermione replied with a smile. Hermione couldn't help but wonder if Molly knew about this project of Arthur's. She certainly hoped it wasn't a secret, for who knew what Aurelian would say. I came to let you know that it was time for lunch. Mummy, Aurelian said again as Hermione lifted him out of the sidecar and pulled off the headphones. Uncle Art has a telly, but it not works, though. Someday, Arthur said with a frustrated look at the item in the corner. Bit tricky it is. Hermione followed his gauge to the large 60s television and felt sorry for him. She had a feeling that he'd never get the thing to work, even with magic, but she didn't think she could tell him so. Perhaps when he bought a new television in the future, she'd give him the one presently sitting in her flat just so long as Molly didn't find out. Well, you two go on in. I'll be there in a minute, Mr. Weasley smiled. Okay, let's go wash your hands, Hermione said to Aurelian. Thanks again for lunch, Molly, and for watching Aurelian, too, Hermione said sincerely. It's our pleasure, dear, Molly answered, 
Are you sure you need to be getting home? Yes, I haven't been home since... Well, it's been a few days, Hermione answered, unsure of how to refer to Aurelian's sudden appearance two days before. Okay, dear. You just come by any time, though. I'm always happy to watch Ari if you need me to. Would you like to take home some of the scones we made today? Molly asked. Please, please, Aurelian begged and yanked on his mother's arm. Yes, I think we would like that, Hermione agreed. Aurelian smiled up at her. Okay, well, here you go. Can we be expecting you both for dinner? Uh, no, Professor McGonagall is going to be stopping by sometime this afternoon or evening. Thank you, though. Okay, Aurelian, let's get going. Hermione bent down and scooped the boy up in her free arm and walked over to the fireplace. When he saw that Hermione's hands were full, Arthur threw a pinch of the flu powder in for her. Hermione nodded in appreciation, stepped into the flames, and announced clearly, 23 Redburn Street. Aurelian held his head up tight to Hermione's shoulder and didn't pull away until the spinning feeling stopped. Hermione stepped out into the small living room of her one-bedroom flat. Where are we, Mummy? Aurelian asked as Hermione placed him on the floor. This is my home. Do you like it? She asked his opinion more to thwart any questions he might have about going to the manor than to really know his thoughts on her much smaller place. It's small, he said. Small but cozy, she replied with a smile. Yes, you have his telly, he shouted excitedly as he ran over to the television. It works? Yes, and I have one in the bedroom, too, she chuckled. This is a muggle house? Aurelian asked curiously. Well, sort of. I'm muggle-born, and I still like muggle things, but there's a lot of magic here, too, Hermione explained. But this is in muggle London, so we have to be very careful to make sure that no one sees our magic. You can have a look around if you'd like. Aurelian walked around appraising the flat in a very professional manner, though with a toddler-like twist. He touched the sofa to see how soft it was, then bent down and tried to see if he could squeeze underneath it. He was quite pleased when he discovered that he could. He then proceeded to inspect the kitchen, poking around until he found the cupboard with sweets. After receiving permission to take a peppermint toad, he made his way down the short hallway. He peeked into the bathroom, looked at Hermione, and asked the important question. You have toys, mummy? Toys for the bath? No, I'm sorry, I don't. We'll get some, though. We'll go out pretty soon and get you some new clothes and some new toys. Would you like that? Hermione asked. I pick them out? Aurelian asked excitedly. Sure, it could be fun, she agreed. But for now, it's time for rest. No, no nap, he whined with a pout. I'm sorry, but you look exhausted. Little boys need their rest. Hermione took hold of his hand and led him into her bedroom. Whenever you're done with your rest, we'll have a look at what Molly packed for you. I know she said she has some things to keep you busy. I'm sure they must be fun. Wow, that bed too big for me, Aurelian said, staring at the queen-size mattress. It is a big bed, but I like a big bed, and I'm sorry, but it's the only bed in the house right now, Hermione explained. If it's okay, I thought we might try to share it tonight. If not, one of us could sleep on the sofa. I sleep in bed with you? Aurelian asked. Please, mummy? Well, not right now. We'll give it a try tonight, okay? You have to test it out and let me know what you think. With a smile and no more arguments, Aurelian climbed into the bed and underneath the covers. Get some sleep, Hermione said as she ran her fingers through his light brown hair. Aurelian sighed and closed his eyes and Hermione left the room quietly. She returned to the living room and sighed. It seemed that every time she stopped for a moment, the weight of everything settled back in. She didn't really know what to do with herself. Luckily, she was saved from thinking on it when a tapping sound caught her attention. With a soft smile, she walked to the window and let in a ministry barn owl. She wasn't quite sure what it was that set the ministry owls apart from any other, but they were easy to spot. Maybe it was their air of self-importance that made them look different. The way they held themselves, perhaps. At one time in her life, a visit from a ministry owl would have made her nervous. As part of her work, she began to receive them daily, so that anxiety had been removed. This owl, she knew, would likely be from Harry or Ron. She untied the letter from the owl's leg and gave it a treat from the jar near a windowsill. It hooted proudly and returned to the skies. Hermione smiled at the letter. Harry's handwriting, for somewhat sloppy scrawl that it was, was easily recognized. She opened it, already having a feeling what it might be. Hermione, I just wanted to let you know that I'm back at Ron's office this afternoon. We're looking through his department's recent reports for any suspicious activity that might pertain to our investigation. We'd love your help if you're interested, but if you'd prefer to stay at home, I completely understand. Harry. P.S. I'm sorry I left so quickly without telling you where I was going. I hope you weren't concerned. Hermione smiled and shook her head. It was as she suspected. 
She hadn't known exactly what he would do, but she knew that he would go over the information in his head, research it, or talk to Ron. It didn't surprise her when he chose all three. She set the letter down and walked into her kitchen where she kept stationary quills and ink in a small drawer of her kitchen couch. Dear Harry, thank you for the letter, and I don't think I'll be joining you this afternoon. I've already picked up Aurelian from the burrow, and we're spending the rest of the day on my flat. I talked to Professor McGonagall after you left, and she's allowing us to borrow the pensive. She's bringing it by this evening. Either Owl or Flew me to let me know what the plan is for tomorrow. Sincerely, Hermione. Hermione walked around her tiny kitchen table and opened the sliding glass door and led to the small balcony. Orwell, she called. In response, a medium-sized owl took flight from a nearby tree and alighted on the iron balcony railing next to her. Orwell was a beautiful black-sooted owl and large black eyes. He had a very round face, a tiny white spots on his head and crest. He'd been a gift to herself shortly after the war, when she had gone to Australia to retrieve her parents. She'd originally thought him a simple and practical purchase. She would need a way to send letters, and she no longer had the school owls at her disposal. After the war, she felt rather withdrawn and numb and no desire for new close connections. To her, Orwell was not to be a pet, only a way to send parcels and letters. However, she soon discovered that Orwell was much more than that. He was a brilliant bird and seemed to know what she needed better than she did. A few times when she'd felt down, Orwell had flown to Grimmauld Place or to the burrow and simply waited for someone to write a letter for her. She very quickly began to consider him a good and faithful companion, rather than just a feathery flying postman. Things had certainly changed since that time. That was what she liked to tell herself. Things had changed. The world around her had changed greatly. She was living alone and was happy with her time of solitude. She had a nice job at which she performed well. She regularly saw her friends at work and spent one evening a week at the borough for dinner, as well as Sunday brunch at her parents. But even with all the changes that had taken place around her, she often felt very much the same. As soon as she had brought her parents home and she set up with a home and a job, she quickly fell into a routine. She then began to cling tightly to that routine to give her sense of stability in the only way she knew. Change frightened her. From the day she first received her Hogwarts letter until the end of the war, her life had been filled with changes over which she had very little control. For the past two years, she held on to her routine, not wavering from it, steadying herself and wait for that next blow. And here, here it was. Aurelian arrived and her world was again changed forever. Frightened her. I'm sorry to wake you, Orwell. Hermione gently stroked the owl's head. But I need you to take a letter for me. It's for Harry. He's at the ministry, so not a far flight. Orwell hooted in understanding and took flight as soon as the letter was tied to his leg. Later that evening, Hermione let out a great sigh, placed a freshly cleaned plate in the rack beside the sink, and wiped her brow with her arm rather than her hand to avoid her wet, sudsy fingers. She could not, since her first day at Hogwarts, imagine living her life without magic. But there were still many things she preferred to do by hand. Washing dishes was one of those things. If she was busy, then she had no issue setting the sponge and sink to clean the dishes themselves, but she very rarely found herself that busy. She just placed a pot from dinner into the sink when she found herself in such a position. Her fireplace chimed to announce someone trying to use her flu. She quickly rinsed the bubbles from her hands, set the pot to be cleaned with a simple swish of her wand, and shuffled quickly into the living room. Hello? she asked as she took a peek into the fireplace. Oh! Hermione stepped back in surprise when she saw the face of Draco Malfoy bobbing inside the bed of green flames. Um, uh, uh, hi? she greeted awkwardly. Hello, Draco said stiffly. He looked quite uncertain himself. I didn't mean to startle you. No, no, it's okay, she assured him, her shock lessening. Did, is Harry there? He interrupted. Oh, no, he's not, she said in an apologetic voice. I don't know where he is, honestly. I could find him, though, and let him know that you're looking for him? No, he replied a bit harshly. I mean, I'm not. I wanted to speak with you. Oh, Hermione felt a little uncomfortable again. He wished to speak with her alone when Harry wasn't with her. He took note of her apprehension and asked, Do you mind if I come and speak with you in person? Um, sure. She tried to sound kind and confident and relaxed, but her unusually high pitch belied her attempt to appear natural and at ease. Draco nodded and disappeared from the fire. Hermione quickly took a moment to look herself over and groaned. As soon as Professor McGonagall had left, Hermione had changed into sleep pants and a tank top and pulled her hair into a messy ponytail to do the dishes. She looked far too messy to accept company. She quickly became irritated when she caught herself with these thoughts. She shouldn't have felt the need to dress up for anyone, especially Malfoy. 
He was the one who'd stopped by in the evening unannounced. Hermione hadn't even been aware that he knew where she lived. In fact, she wondered how he'd found that out. She quickly caught herself again as she realized she was going too far the other way in her overly harsh reaction. She was sure that he wouldn't stop by simply to stress her out, though it was a side effect. He probably had something important to say if he felt that he couldn't wait until the next day to speak to her. Her thoughts were stopped abruptly when the green flames roared to life in the grate and Draco Malfoy stepped into her living room again. Good evening, he said a bit stiffly as he inclined his head. Hi, she said again, feeling even more insecure in her night clothes while he was still wore nicely pressed robes. I don't mean to intrude or anything, he said. Hermione relaxed a bit when she saw that Draco looked as uncomfortable as she felt. He tried to look at her, but his eyes darted away and quickly back repeatedly. No, it's okay, she assured him, as a bit of a smile pulled at the corner of her mouth. So, uh, where's, where's Aurelian? He asked in an attempt to make casual conversation. Oh, he, uh, he's in my room. He fell asleep watching cartoons, Hermione said with a small chuckle. What are cartoons? Draco asked. Oh, um, cartoons? It's television. It's a thing that I know what a television is, Draco interrupted, his tone a bit defensive. Oh, right. Sorry, she apologized. Knowing how anti-muggle he had been at school, she had just assumed that he wouldn't know. So, um, what did you need to talk to me about? Aurelian, he answered seriously. I want to see him. Hermione's stomach immediately began to swirm with anxiety. Her mouth felt dry and it became a bit difficult to swallow. I... She paused and took even breaths before she could continue. I don't think that'd be such a good idea. I don't mean now, Draco explained quickly. He suddenly relaxed and looked more casual than she'd ever seen him. I mean, I don't want you to wake him up. I just mean, I know what you meant, Hermione interrupted quietly. His eyes narrowed a bit. And I just really don't think it's such a good idea. Why not? He stiffened again, and his eyes looked darker under the shadow of a creased brow. Things are confusing enough as it is. I just think it would be better if you only saw him as part of the investigation, she answered solemnly. I'm his father, he growled. I know that, she replied. But while that's true, it's not. You're not the person he knows as daddy. You're not the person he knows as mummy, either, he countered. I know, but that can't be helped. I'm what he has right now. And I'm trying, I know. But I think that it's better if you don't, she interrupted. He's confused. He needs a constant in his life right now. But you'll let him see the Weasleys. Half of them are dead to him. He's going to start wondering where James is if he hasn't already. You don't think that confuses him? Draco demanded. It does, but he's adapting. He has to adapt. He hasn't a choice. But I don't want to make things any harder for him than they have to be. He needs consistency in his life, and I think he can find that with me and the Weasleys, Hermione explained calmly. But you don't think he can find that with me, he stated. No, I don't, she answered seriously, her voice calm. You're not the same man that we saw in the pensive. You don't, you don't know who I am. I know I don't, which is what makes me uncomfortable with the idea of you being around him. I'm his father, Draco raged, which is why I'm taking this so seriously. You're not just anyone. You're his father. This isn't a game. This is his life, she said earnestly, her voice rising slightly. Being part of his life isn't something you take lightly. You can't just pop in whenever you feel like it. It's a commitment. And you don't think I can make that kind of commitment. He stared at her fiercely, his jaw set. Honestly, no. And I don't want him to get hurt when you change your mind. And how do you know that I'll change my mind? He demanded. How do I know that you won't? Hermione retorted. Her temper rose as she added, You don't like me or any of the people in my life. How do you think that is possibly good for him to see his parents constantly at each other's throats? Then stop trying to slash mine, Draco shouted. Shut up or you'll wake him, Hermione ordered. Good, it might be the only way I can see him, he argued. He's my son, whether you like it or not. And are you ready to admit that? Are you ready to take him home and show your mother? Are you ready for your friends and family to know that you had a child with me? Making a commitment to play his parent is a lot bigger than you think it is, Hermione stated furiously. Her eyes narrowed. You don't know what I think, Draco told her, his gray eyes boring into hers. My answer is still no, Draco, she answered flatly. Yeah, well, don't expect me to just accept that, he replied darkly. Thanks for your time, Granger. Draco grabbed a pinch of flu powder from the leather sack that hung from her mantle and threw it into the fire. He turned and glared at her once more before he stepped into the flames and vanished. 
Hermione sank down onto the sofa and took a deep breath. Angry tears filled her eyes, and she wanted nothing more than to curl up in bed alone, but that would not be possible any time in her near future. She had already made that commitment that she had just explained to Draco. Aurelia needed a loving mother that would always be there to protect him, and she would be. Her future self entrusted her with this great responsibility, knowing she could handle it. After a few steadying breaths, Hermione turned off the lights and returned to her room. She smiled sadly at the boy in the bed and walked over to him. Gently, she moved him over to the side of the bed that was pressed against the wall. He moaned peacefully and rolled onto his side. She crawled under the covers herself and turned onto her side to look at him. He was beautiful, and although he was a big change in her life, it was sure to be a beautiful change. She'd make certain it was.